was reviewing movies when I was 25 years old. Hard to believe. Some of the old critics never even wore a gun. A lot of folks that read YouTube comments find that hard to believe. I always like to hear about the old critics. Never miss a chance to do so. Can't help but compare yourself to the old critics. Can't help but wonder how they'd operate in these times with these films. There's this movie. Papers say it was a film of passion, but the director said there wasn't any passion to it. Not in the sense that we think. A passion for something good. He wanted it to be bad. A new kind of bad we've never witnessed. And I don't know what to make of that. I surely don't. It's not that I'm afraid of it. But I don't want to push my chips forward and go and confront something I don't understand. Yeah, he's here. I don't know why he didn't answer any of our calls. He's just been sitting here looking at a movie. All right, I'll see you guys when you get the shoot. Critic, are you okay? Step out of the car, please. What's that? I need you to step out of the car. What is that for? Hold still. Please. Welcome to Fan Video. We don't know how we're still around either. Oh, returning movie? How was it? What business is it of yours how the movie was? Fredo. I didn't mean nothing by it. Didn't mean nothing. Will there be something else? I don't know. Will there? Is something wrong? Is that what you're asking me? If something's wrong? Or if I saw a comedy so bad it changes your perception of bad altogether? You think you've seen every type of shitty humor, gross-out humor, anti-humor, epic movie. But then one comes along that's not only bad on purpose, but it elevates bad to a new level you didn't even know existed. A level that embraces misery to a point that you have to laugh. So, I guess it's working because it makes you laugh. But it's only making you laugh because the only other alternative is to cry. You laugh because you have no choice. You laugh because it's destroying you. What kind of film could do that? <sighs> Call it. Call what? Just call it. You want me to call what the movie is? Think of the only film that can be impressively bad yet leaves no joy. Can get a laugh even though it's not funny. Can expand someone to a new level of awful he wants to escape yet is constantly drawn in by. What type of bad creates a world so painful that you stay in it? Because it's so fascinating. Oh, well that's Freddy Got Fingered. Well done. Okay, then I'll just put this back on the shelf. Well, don't put it on the shelf. Well, where am I supposed to put it? Anywhere but not on the shelf. Or else it gets mixed in with the others and just becomes another movie. Which it is. Oh, hey, you forgot your grenade! You didn't forget this, did you? Tom Green. In the early 2000s, he became very popular for his unique brand of anti-humor. Some called him an attention-desperate whore, while others called him... Everybody called him an attention-desperate whore, but his fans didn't seem to care. Partaking in shocking stunts most normal people wouldn't do, like sucking a cow's teat, humping a dead moose, or marrying Drew Barrymore, only got him more popularity. To his credit, there were occasional funny bits, like following pizza delivery boys to offer the same pizza for cheaper, demonstrating how to camouflage yourself by blending into the audience. This was a guy who had some comprehension of comedy, but his favorite brand of humor was just being shockingly odd. Putting things in his mouth, um, things in his mouth, and... Yeah, it was very mouth-based. 
After he starred in a hit film, 20th Century Fox gave him a movie to write, direct, and star in with very little interference. The only thing they seem to put their foot down is that it couldn't be NC-17. In that, we'll still shoot an NC-17 film, we'll just have to bribe the MPAA more than usual to not have it be rated NC-17. It was destroyed by critics, failed at the box office, and won several Razzie Awards, of which Tom Green accepted the awards, even bringing his own red carpet. From day one, when we started writing it, said, uh, we wanted to win a Raspberry Award, so, so uh, it's, I'm glad my dream has come true. Whatever you thought of this guy, he had a plan, and he achieved it. Whatever it was. The film over the years has been getting a cult following of people saying it's a unique kind of bad, one never truly seen in cinema. A so bad it's bad, and that bad is so bad it's bad, and that bad is so bad it's bad, and that bad is so bad it's good, and that good is so bad it's bad. Was there actual clever thought put into how purposefully terrible this was? Did it reach a new level of awful that you can actually admire the technique of it? Admire is a bad word to use, but I can think of no other in my current state of shit home syndrome. Let's take a deeper look with Freddy Got Fingered. X-ray cat! You can't get me, you can't get me! You get a glance at what John Chris Lucy now does with his time as we see our main character named Gord, played by Canada's Punishment, leaves his home during the credits to do some 90s-ing. <laughs> I think the editor was drunk because, you know, he's doing Freddy Got Finger, but he left in these weird freeze frames because, you know, he's doing Freddy Got Finger. Who cares? This whole intro shows that Tom Green can skateboard, reinforcing the rumor that he is in fact good at something. I call it fake news. He meets up with his parents, played by Rip Torn and Julie Haggerty, who are really wishing right now they had anyone's career that wasn't Rip Torn or Julie Haggerty. I believe in my son. He'd be a good man. Gord says he's going to Hollywood to become a famous animator like Charles Schultz. I'm gonna be a famous animator like Charles Schultz. Who was a comic strip artist, not an animator. I'm not implying you don't know this, I'm implying Tom Green doesn't know this. And we see this dialogue is so repetitive, it's borderline funny. In fact, you can measure the amount of laughter it almost gets by how many times they say the word proud. You make your daddy proud, you hear me? I'm gonna make you proud, daddy. I'm gonna make you so proud. You make your daddy proud. You're gonna be so proud. 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 Get the fuck out of the way! Yep, see, that was close. But then it... continued to exist. On his way there, he sees a horse dick, screams, pulls over, and jerks it off. Life has given me that sentence to report to you. Oh, this is fun! Look at me, daddy! I'm a farmer! There's no reason for why he pulled over, screamed, and touched that horse, and it never comes back into the movie again. I've never been so happy to have a scene not explained to me. He makes it to Radioactive Animation, or as the rest of the world calls it, Sony Studios. But he first gets a job at a cheese sandwich factory, where he does this. I'm a sexy boy! Ding dong! Ding dong! Ding dong! How would you like to put that on your resume? I was the woman who got slapped by Tom Green's salami dick. You deserve an Oscar just for being near him. He sneaks into the studio where a secretary, played by Drew Barrymore, talks to him, which is impressive because the film is now presenting four to five failed career choices in one continuous shot. You're just suddenly reminded of all the wrong things these two actors did in their lifetimes. His wife is dead. What? He tells Cousin It that he's there to tell one of the head honchos that his wife is dead, as well as inform them that the color corrector has died, seeing how these two shots clearly don't match up. I guess you could argue this brightness contrast in green tint is part of the purposefully bad filmmaking, even though it doesn't happen anywhere else in the film. But I like to think they're in the Matrix, and Morpheus is going to erase the glitch that is Tom Green. What if I told you you're annoying as balls? Could I be your boyfriend? Get out of here! No. Fuck off! You're a skinny loser! Hey, I think this is how they divorced. <laughs> Definitely how they divorced. He finds the head of the studio, played by Anthony Michael Hall, who's slowly realizing weird science might be the most normal thing he's ever been in. My name's Gord, and I want to meet you to show you my drawings. Your drawings? Yes. To make things stranger, I swear, there's a heavier version of Hall sitting directly behind him. It's like a yin and yang of the Breakfast Club, even down to wearing the exact same suit but with black and white shirts. Which is also ironic because you both look like you're auditioning for Cobra Kai. I'm not saying this film is dumb enough to do that, I'm saying this film is not smart enough to be that dumb. 
Okay, so let me get this right. You want to just barge into a restaurant, dress like a fucking English Bobby, and expect someone to give you a TV show? Why not? It's how I got this movie. Hall tells him that while the drawings are good, nothing funny is happening, and he needs to flesh out the characters more to make something of worth. This is literally before he goes back home, and we find out more about the characters that are going to be in most of the movie. What you need here is elevation, okay? There actually has to be something that happens that's actually funny. I hate to say it, but that can't be a coincidence. That must have taken... thought. I'm trying to give you a piece of advice. You gotta figure these animals out. You gotta figure them out. You gotta get inside the animals. I gotta get inside the animals? Get inside the animals. Well, dicks, I wonder where this is going. <laughs> yeah... I'll give it this. It could be funny if he's approached by Nicolas Cage in a bear suit who punches him to the ground. We all know Cage will do anything, he'll probably do it twice. After dressing up in the deer's dead skin, he's hit by a truck that, quite frankly, I want to see again. Why couldn't the editor choose to freeze that scene? One more time. So he goes back home, the animation plot doesn't really come back except for a few minutes at the end, and most of the movie is just him with his family. I'd say how random, but it, weirdly enough, feels very planned out. In fact, in another bizarre twist, his best friend is played by Harlan Williams. For those who don't know, this is one of the most surreal, zaniest stand-ups you could imagine. When you want things to get weird, you always have him show up. Shiver me timber, shlorkety dark, florkety dark. <laughs> I see you've moved the sidebones from your butt cheeks up to the side of your face. <laughs> Yeah, he casts him as the straight man. The common sense guy who tries to be reasonable to Green's crazy antics. What do you think it's kind of dark, Gord? It's late, you're gonna wake up your parents. You gotta work tomorrow, you know? You see, this is more than just one giant middle finger. This is a giant middle finger made up of tiny little middle fingers that compose the entire thing. It's a middle finger on so many levels. I do hope it upholds Rip Torn's contract of any time he's in a movie, he has to scream gibberish. <laughs> well, I think the live-action Lion King found their first note for Circle of Life. <laughs> it will evoke tears. Look, his friend hurt his leg. We need an idiot to put his tongue on it. Tom, do you know of anyone that could help? Cameras were turned on for this. He visits his friend in the hospital where we come across the only consistently funny character, Betty, played by Marissa Cullen. The hospital's always this fun? <laughs> no, sometimes, sometimes, people, um, sometimes people here die of cancer. <laughs> okay, so it is possible to make Tom Green's writing funny. Good to know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Betty. And I'm the two kids from BoJack pretending to be an adult. Surprisingly, I've made a good career out of it. He hits it off with her and they schedule a date as he visits his friend who's next to a woman giving birth. Oh, the possibilities are one. Oh, it's okay, I'm a doctor. Did you know the original title for this was The Audience Got Fisted? After biting the umbilical cord with his teeth, because at this point I'd be shocked if he didn't do that. He swings the baby around to wake it up, and quite literally, with no segue, it's an emotional moment. I mean it, no segue. Watch. <laughs> it's actually so jarring how much the two don't go together and how much it has nothing to do with anything in the film. I... thought about laughing. And then I whipped myself. Whipping myself felt better. Speaking of which, Gord goes to Betty's place where he discovers she gets incredibly turned on when she's hit with a bamboo stick. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! To the one person whose fetish is finally being lived out, congratulations. To the rest of us, what the shit is going on? He also discovers that she wants to be a rocket scientist so she can have a rocket power her chair. No, I mean, you tried to make the rocket wheelchair work, but it doesn't work. That must make you feel like a stupid dummy, right? <laughs> oh, don't try to be charming now, Tom Green. You're so naturally likable. 
He accidentally hits her in the face, though, which means he's earned a blowjob. I'm gonna give you a blowjob. Um. I think this is how most Tom Green fans think dating works. She discovers, though, that he still has his umbilical cord. It's taped. It's just for fun. I taped it there for fun. I can't think of any possible way to make that funny, so I'm just gonna continue with the story I started before. Hey, critic, are you here? You weren't at the studio. Are we still shooting today? Man, I got my costume and everything. Hello, Malcolm. Let's go to my room. You don't have to do this. I could just go home. Let me ask you this. If a film is meant to be so bad that nobody would like it, then what is the purpose of the film if people like it? Is it a failure if it's hated by everyone? Or a failure if it's enjoyed by a select few, even some well-known names? Do you have any idea how crazy you are? You mean the nature of this movie? I mean the nature of you. Did you ever think how much thought would go into making the absolute worst thing ever? If you believe, as some philosophers do, that complete perfection is hell, then what's the opposite? What's heaven? Nothing but flaws. Oh my god, are you one of those assholes that defends Freddy Got Fingered? really hurt. A lot. Oh God. Hello? Yes. Is Malcolm there? Not in the sense that you mean. Critic, what's going on? Where's Malcolm? You need to come see me. Are we shooting today or what? You know how this is going to turn out, don't you? What in the hell are you talking about? Line from No Country for Old Men. Okay, look, just stay there. I'm going to come and shoot, okay? Oh, by the way, how was the movie? What is the movie? So after Gore gets his much earned BJ, he decides to take a shower back at home in a scuba suit. It's a treasure. Get out of my goddamn scuba gear, you imbecile! That too deserves repeating. Oh. Torn escapes this realm of madness, squeezing past the camera that even leaves a shadow on him. Another glitch in the Matrix. Lord knows I could use an exploding Hugo weaving at this point. He talks with his brother Freddy, who works at a bank, and constantly tells Gord he needs to grow up. Let's cross our fingers and hope that I get a job. I'm serious. All right, fingers crossed. I hope I get a jobby. I got my fingers Bye, crossed. Gord. I got my fingers crossed. Oh, I get it. This movie sucks. I'm actually wondering if there was an Oscar caliber film about a dysfunctional family who has to deal with their son who's addicted to drugs. They just forgot to put the drugs part in. This would be a dramatic powerhouse if he was on crystal meth. Did you get a job? I got a job and... I wanted to surprise you. He lies to both his father and Betty that he got a job, and Betty takes him out to celebrate. Oh, I know this place. It's the same upscale restaurant that doesn't allow Mr. Bean, the Three Stooges, Ace Ventura, the Marx Brothers, Charlie Chaplin, Benny Hill, Laurel and Hardy, Jerry Lewis, or the Tiny Toons Inn. I believe it's called Fine How Do You Do. Again, though, just listen to this dialogue and tell me they're not aware, if not mocking, this exact setup. Would you like a piece of cake for dessert? Am I really allowed a piece of cake, Daddy? Of course you can have a piece of cake. It's your birthday. Yay! Yay! I'm honestly shocked the restaurant dialogue isn't just replaced with this. Most orthodox, most orthodox, most orthodox, most orthodox, most orthodox, most orthodox, most orthodox. Is your job really hard? I mean, I have graphs, I have some graphs I can show you. If you pay attention to these patterns here, you can see on the graphs. I think we're witnessing the pitch for the movie here. Why would this do well? Graphs! 
Just graphs. You're fired! You're fucking fired, Bob! I'm talking about 40 million fucking points back here, Bob! You know, he seems like an unsuccessful Gruber brother. Hans, Simon, and Gord. More focused on terrorism of comedy. If you laugh, he shoots you. Gord's father sees he lied, though, and calls him out on it. Wait a minute. You're a cripple. Dad. <laughs> hey, Dad, just shut up, okay? Just shut up! Yeah, don't you know it's offensive to use that word? Now this shit... <laughs> Look at me, Daddy! I'm a farmer! Ding dong! Ding dong! <laughs> Class. Big surprise, they trash the place and are told to stop because it's a fancy restaurant. No, really, those are the exact words. Oh, this is a fancy restaurant! This is a fancy restaurant! It's kind of like saying, don't trash the Taj Mahal, it's mmm! Betty bails him out, which is kind of funny, thinking the parents just left him there in jail, and she says he should have just told her the truth. You could have told me that you lived at home, I wouldn't have cared. Even though that means I'm a loser? Just because you're not a stockbroker doesn't mean you're a loser. Being Tom Green is because you're a loser. Oh, here's an important fact. Oh, my ear popped. My ear just popped. <laughs> I think I heard it. Uh, when I laughed, my ear popped. That was written into the movie. Somebody said it was essential for those words to go in that moment. She advises him to relax by eating, playing music, and drawing, so you get this remix of nightmares that you've had for the past couple weeks. Daddy, would you like some sausage? Daddy, would you like some sausages? Daddy, would you like some sausage? Fun fact, this is a dark ride at Disneyland's ninth level of hell. Daddy, would you like some sausage? Daddy, would you like some sausages? Okay, so this is gonna sound strange. Yeah, but listen to this line. If this were Pakistan, you would have been sewing soccer balls when you were four years old. I want you to remember he said that line, because believe it or not, there is a weird-ass way it comes back into the story. Don't guess how. You can't. No, really, don't. You can't. Just stop. You can't. So his best friend says that his father really- You can't! Give up! So his best friend says his father really seems like a character, and he should focus more on him. And that's exactly what the movie suddenly does. There's a lot more focus on the father and his connection with Gord for a long time. I think an Academy Award nominated script owes someone some royalties. His father runs over his skateboard ramp as once again it goes from crazy taxi music to emotional music in the length of a bed bug's disc throw. We shouldn't put up with the way he treats us. If I were you, I wouldn't stand for it. If I were you, I'd go out, I'd have sex with strange men, I'd have sex with basketball players, I'd have sex with Greeks. You will believe God hates you and wants you to know it. We cut to a scene where they're at a family psychiatrist, but honestly, I think this scene exists just to have Tom Green and Sigmund Freud in the same frame. Because let's face it, that opportunity will never happen again. Well, at least I don't touch Freddy. Very what? He fingers him. Yeah, I guess we're almost two-thirds done with the movie. Might as well have some reference to the title. I am required by law to notify the authorities. <laughs> you hear that, Dad? You're gonna pay! Ah! Humanity was a mistake. Ah! Ah! You liar! We then cut to Freddy watching someone's insides get ripped out of him by supposed professionals. Again, that can't be a coincidence. The doctor comes to take Freddy away despite him denying that his dad ever touched him. It's not your fault your dad fingered you. What are you talking about? My dad doesn't finger me. Come on, son. We'll take you out of here. The... Music almost sounded disappointed that he wasn't fingered. Hell, with this film, maybe we're supposed to be. He's taken away and his father gets drunk, claiming he didn't do anything sexually wrong while doing something sexually wrong. Well, I can cross that off my bucket list, seeing Rip Torn's naked ass and regretting it. I was very drunk when I made that list. Gord decides to give up on his dreams as Betty continues to work on her rocket-powered chair and, let me guess, Gord comes to be a jackass. Shut up, Betty. Just shut up. Can't you see we're both just a couple of stupid idiots? Gordy! Gord! Gordy! Alright, look, lady, I know you're a crazy, horny, obsessive, emotionally denying, masochistic nymphomaniac, but you can still do better than Tom Green! You see it, buddy? We then cut to Freddy in the... Institute for Sexually Molested Children? Where he's surrounded by out of control kids listening to creepy music and watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre? You got fingered? No. Okay? It's okay. I know. I was.
wasn't here for a second, was I? That scene actually took me someplace else. A place not of this realm. It was not a good place. In fact, it was a very, very bad place. One of the worst places I've ever been. But it was so bad, I almost want to go back to it. I want to study it. I want to understand how on every level of unpleasantness this scene went above and beyond what I thought possible in a film. James Gunn was fired for tweeting scenes like this. And this guy was given $14 million to bring it to the big screen. I have never witnessed a scene like that in cinema. And only this story and this tone could build up to something so heinous. There is no place you can look, no area you can escape to, nothing else you can think about except every possible ugliness crammed into this one moment. You saw it, didn't you? I can't unsee it. That's why you're standing there, aren't you? Instead of running out and calling the police like what that woman should have done, no country for old men. I totally don't get why she didn't do that. He was really far away. She had plenty of time to get out of there. But this scene... This scene is even more terrifying. Sit. You don't have to view this. <laughs> People always say the same thing. What do they say? They say, you don't have to view this. You don't? I need to understand what can't be understood, what shouldn't be understood. So call it. Are you watching the rest of the movie with me? Or are you taking the other way out? I knew you were crazy when I saw you watching that movie. Call it. No, I ain't calling it. Call it. The movie doesn't have any say. It's you. You decide what has worth and what doesn't. Call it. By the way, I totally killed her. So after every terrible thing you can imagine is put on screen, we then cut to Leave it to Beaver. Leave it to Beaver. They even cut back to it twice after that scene. Leave it to Beaver. I don't know what they're doing, but I know they're doing it! Gord's mother leaves the movie because, oh Jesus, she needs a reason. And I never fingered Freddy! <laughs> oh yeah, there's a running joke that this kid always gets hurt. I guess I was too busy mentioning the other child abuse to bring up that child abuse. Life choices. Gord sees that Betty accomplished her dreams though, which gives him inspiration to accomplish his. Bringing his story about a zebra centaur family to the studio. Half zebra. Right. Clash of the Titans. That's yeah, it. right, sure. Yeah. I saw it. Yeah, I get half it. Half man, it. half zebra mutant. He's a, he's a the myth. The myth. He's a, he's a myth. It's like a, Greek, it's like a Greek myth. Interesting note, this page of the script wasn't written, so they just improvised the whole thing. Sure. It's like a Greek myth. Sure. Except African. African. Myths. African American Greek myth. myth. I'm amazed how much it shows, too. His dad follows him in, taking out Barrymore in his anger. <laughs> well, it's more kind than the other version they shot. His father tears up the place, which, of course, convinces the producer to write a check? I have never seen a more creative or exciting pitch than that. I wasn't even thinking about writing a check today. I'm completely comfortable greenlighting this fucking project. I think we just saw how most adult swim shows are made. Listen to my hooves! Yeah! Listen to my hooves! Yeah! Yep, definitely a documentary on adult swim show creators. He makes the show, grabs a helicopter, and confesses his love to Betty. I think because he felt big things had to happen at the end, even though there's no reason. No, I'm not mocking the film. I really think that's the mindset. I'm giving in to the Stockholm. So I just wanna... I just wanna suck your cock. And so is she, clearly. He then takes the majority of his budget money and spends it all on one big stunt, acknowledging he totally wasted his big opportunity. And then you add the $750,000, that's all my money. That's all my money gone. <laughs> no, easy come, easy go. 
<laughs> it's aware, it's aware. It's like watching Caesar, this dumb animal becoming more and more conscious but not wanting to let anyone catch on. You damn dirty ape, what are you up to? So, you remember that line the father had from earlier? If this were Pakistan, you would have been sewing soccer balls when you were four years old. Well, Gore took part of his house with his father in it to Pakistan. Now, you might be wondering what's the connection outside of the father just saying the word Pakistan once. I have no idea, but he did say it and I'm reporting on it. Please send your fan theories to this address and never breed. He couldn't even center the one week later caption. In any other film, I'd say that's a mistake, but I don't think it is here. I think he did it on purpose just to make everything in this goddamn film a little off. You know he'd do it! You know that's what happened. So after he sprays his father with elephant jizz, and this film really is too predictable, they finally seem to patch things up. What the hell it is they're patching up, I have no idea. I know I'll never be the man you want me to be, but I'm your son. I want you to be proud. Aw, it's the heart of the film. And that he's probably gonna eat the heart of a cow or something. But they're captured and held hostage, causing a worldwide movement of people and news organizations demanding to let them go. Even his mother and new lover Shaquille O'Neal are concerned. I did all this for you. Nipples pierced. Can you do it like this? Huh? Can you do it like that? I didn't do all of this. That horrible moment you realize you can go lower than Kazam. So how are Gord and his father going to get out of this? It's not really made clear. The movie just says they were freed and everyone is on the runway ready to greet him. Just when you're wondering when this movie is going to end, so is the movie. That's really a sign someone is holding as they return. You know, this would be really good if it was good. But the kid runs after them and gets chopped up by the propeller, crying that he's still okay. I'm okay! I'm okay, Dad! Well, of course it would end there. I wouldn't imagine anything less because I actually can't imagine anything less. They then show all the scenes that weren't good enough for the movie. I as well was shocked such a concept exists. And let's give credit that the final thing said is the exact perfect line to end this film. The fuck are you doing? I think that's the most poignant question you could ask this movie, but I will say I did ask it. It is hard to find words to describe the impact this film has left. It is clearly bad, and it is intended to be bad, probably aiming to be the baddest thing humanly possible. It's too self-aware to just be run-of-the-mill dumb, but the level of insulting idiocy is so grand you could call it ahead of its time in terms of troll humor. Possibly even the greatest troll movie ever made. It's like the film wants to be a regular bad comedy, but it's too dumb to know how to do it. And it glorifies the hell out of knowing that. It achieves exactly what it's looking for, pissing off everyone in the stupidest of ways. And my inner troublemaker has a strange respect for that. It's the Barton Fink of bad films. I don't always know the intent behind the madness, but I'm convinced the filmmakers know. I have never come across a movie like this in my life. I hate everything about it for the exact same reasons I love everything about it. And this is a whole new phenomenon that comes from him. Him. You know, I had a dream the other night. There were two pits. One was filled with the most delicious caviar the world has ever known and the other was filled with shit. Tom Green showed up in the carcass of a dead deer and he dived into that pile of shit. He dug so deep into it that he actually found a little bit of caviar that mixed in with the shit. None of us wanted to try it, but he forced it on us. The combination created a brand new flavor never tasted by anyone. It was the most unique tasting thing anyone had ever put in their mouths. It was beyond description. Tom Green winked and said, there's plenty more where that came from, but you can only find it in the shit. I walked up on the edge of that pit, stared out over the biggest pile of shit I've ever seen in my life. I bent over, 
took one big breath. And then I woke up. Daddy, would you like some sausage? 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 And for those of you who think I killed my entire cast for this movie. I did kill Rob, though. He owed me two dollars. Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out and this week we are doing the Fisher House Foundation. The Fisher House Foundation builds comfort homes where military and veteran families can stay free of charge while a loved one is in the hospital. These homes are located at military and medical centers around the world. They have up to 21 suites with private bedrooms and baths with families sharing a common kitchen, laundry facilities, a dining room, and living room. Since its inception, the program has saved military and veteran families an estimated $407 million in out-of-pocket costs for lodging and transportation. The Fisher House Foundation also operates the Hero Miles program, using donated frequent flyer miles to bring family members to the bedside of injured service members. They also use the Hotels for Heroes program as well, using donated hotel points to allow family members to stay at hotels near medical centers without charge. So even if you don't have much money to give, you can also donate flyer miles and or hotel points as well. If you look at their site and their YouTube channel, you can see more than 30,000 families in 2017 alone were helped by this wonderful organization. These people have sacrificed so much, and they're asking you to sacrifice so little. Click on the link and see how you can make so many strong families even stronger. <laughs>